University. I am Melissa Hayward, the chair of the Department of Business, and I'm delighted that you all are joining us for our annual entrepreneurship conference. Throughout the conference on today, you'll hear from several entrepreneurs who discuss their personal journey to entrepreneurship, as well as you'll have the opportunity to hear from some of our Allen University students on why it's so important to be involved and engaged in our business clubs. So again, welcome. Welcome to Allen University's Entrepreneurship Panel Discussion. Tania is the daughter of a Swiss Cadillac sales director, Mathia Campbell, and retired colonel in the Army, Larry Campbell. She started her business with Mary Kay at 18 as a freshman in college at North State University, where she graduated mega cum laude with a BS in accounting. After working for one of the top five accounting firms in the world, Ernest, and young for five years, she retired as an economic driving sales director with over 75 team members in her Mary Kay business. Became a sales director at 24, has been a sales director and driving a Mary Kay car for over 16 years, and is currently earning her fourth team Cadillac. The Cadillac Plus XT6 has been in the court of sharing 11 times, court of sales one time in five unit clubs with her high highest being the past year of 2020 at the half million dollar 500,000 unit club and she completed triple cars as well earning over 15 carats of diamonds and earning over 10 cars from her business. Mr. Clint Fleming is a serial entrepreneur. He earned his business administration degree from the University of South Carolina. He has over 25 years in banking and finance. Mr. Fleming built the Fleming Group into a multi-million dollar business before he sold it. He is currently the owner of multiple small businesses to include a tax preparation company and a Bell Bondsman company. Dr. Kim Carter, the igniter, is a highly sought keynote speaker, workshop presenter, corporate trainer, commencement speaker, executive coach, award-winning academic dean, and published author, an esteemed frontrunner in conscious leadership and training and development. She is a thought leader in cross-cultural management and community development. Each person, team, and community are motivated by Dr. Kim to seek personal and professional clarity for positive change and to establish well-defined direction in all they do. Dr. Kim is also a champion trailblazer for delivering exceptional customer service, providing optional engagement, and producing phenomenal performance outcomes. Her unique speaking and training style bring a wealth of passion, knowledge, and heightened participation to every audience and client interaction. Dr. Kim educates and equips all to immediately use shared tools, resources, and best practices to implement their lives and organization purpose. She is known as the igniter. So welcome everyone to Allen University's Entrepreneurship Con Conference. And this is our panel discussion. Um, it's, it's all about the business. We want to show the diversity in entrepreneurial opportunities across all of the different majors that we have at Allen University. And we are so blessed to have with us um, absolutely successful professionals who have done the academic work to get their education and transitioned it into so many other diverse entrepreneurial opportunities. So we say again, thank you for being with us today. And I'm gonna start this dialogue with the simplest of questions for each of you. And as we go through, I'm gonna ask that um, when we do our questions, I'll address um, who I want to answer it first. And then when that person finishes, I'll ask each of you. And so the same will go for whomever is um, starting the question. So I'm gonna ask this question, starting with Mr. Fleming. Tell us about your educational background and your degrees and um, your foundation that you created before you went into entrepreneurship. Okay, thank you. Again, uh, this is Clint Fleming. Uh, I was born and read 
down in Eastover, South Carolina. Uh, in 1966, I become the I became the first African American to play football at all then white Lorishan High School. I graduated there in 1968. Went to a junior college, got a associate degree in business management, and then went on to the University of South Carolina to get my BA in business administration. I started off in banking with Bankers Trust. I retired. After 30 years with them, early retired at 50, started my own business and employment agency, the Fleming Group. Uh, we actually grew to annual income, annual sales of over 2.5 million in, 19, in 2015. I became ill with prostate cancer, so I decided to sell the company. I'm cancer free. I'm still working, enjoy working, enjoy young people because I really believe being one of 16 kids, the first one to attend college, currently have 42 nieces and nephews and 45 great nieces and nephews Woo! and two great great nieces. So um, I'm working now in order to benefit them. Mm -hmm. uh, I love to put a few dollars in the cash app account. And if they go to college and do what they're supposed to do, I feel that uh, I'm here to assist them uh, in whatever their endeavors are. But the long-term goal for any individual, especially African-American these days, should be eventually owning your own business. Absolutely. And so now we'll go to Tania Payar. So um, my degree is in, I got a BS in accounting from Norfolk State University, HBCU in Norfolk, Virginia. And that's where my education stops. I was, uh, I graduated magna cum laude. Thank you, Lordy, and we're done with that. Okay. <laughs> but, um, and so I am a, a legacy executive in Mary Kay. So my mother has been in Mary Kay for 39 years. So I was able to see her win in Excel. We are actually the only black mother, daughter, pink Cadillac drivers and executive senior sales directors in all of Mary Kay. So I was able to see her legacy. I was able to see her travel the world because of Mary Kay, driving Mary Kay cars all my life. She started when I was 14 months old and my brother was four. So I started my Mary Kay business when I was 18 in college to make some little, little bit of extra money. I left there finished college, started working for one of the top four accounting firms in the world, Ernst & Young. I stayed with them for five years. Then they said, hey, do you want to become a manager? Work even more hours. And I was already working 17 hours a day and become a manager. And I was getting paid um, very well, which was around like 77000 for a brand new college student, right? I think I, I think my my first income was like sixty thousand for a brand new college student. But you definitely work every single day and every single waking moment. I was at work. I did that for five years. I worked my tail off so I could leave. And I like to say I retired because I'm not a quitter. So I retired from there after five years, and I had already. Um, developed my business so that I had team members and had earned several cars before I left um, with my Mary Kay business. And so I was able to achieve some of my dreams. I actually owned the Miss Raleigh pageant, which is a subsidiary of Miss North Carolina, Miss America. My Miss North Carolina, my Miss Raleigh 2000 in nine and 2010 both won miss north carolina so i helped them travel the, the state and help them get ready for miss america so i traveled with them for three years and mary Kay was the business that allowed me the flexibility so i could travel freely and i i 
enjoyed that life. And then I wanted more. I wanted more money with my business. So I looked and seeked the correct mentorship, not only from my mother, who of course brought me into the business, but also from others. So I would say that's one of my tips is um, mentorship and that self-talk. And Dr. Carter. Shudder to say a word after listening to <laughs> I just want to say, let's move on to the next question. I, I'm, I'm very happy though to share that I've had what I've always considered a very robust career history and currently I have been in higher education for 21 years. First started teaching at an HBCU in Ohio, Wilberforce University, and just enjoyed working with learners who wanted to expand their mind, expand their thoughts. So I have a long history in teaching higher ed. I also have been a regional dean for a university, trained other deans and other faculty and staff and absolutely love giving back that way. I'm still in that journey. So I will teach forever, <laughs> I believe, because it's just in my blood and what I love to do. I also have an 18 year history in working for the government. So I climbed away, my way up to the government. I started with local government. I became a housing um, manager. And then I was sought after the state government and I became the state of Ohio's housing manager, housing director. So that, those were fun times. And then I got recruited from there to work for the federal government and stayed in that position and grew. And I became the first African-American female to hold the multifamily hub director position for the United States Department of Housing and Urban Development. So I am so, so blessed to have a long tenured year in the housing multifamily, which is all about financing the housing industry. So totally, totally love that. So I'm still doing some housing consulting. So I do have my own business that I've had for over 13 years. And I do really all those things I shared. I am a housing and community and economic development consultant. So I still get to keep my hands in what's happening with growing communities around the country. I also have a speaking business where I am known as Dr. Kim Carter, the igniter. So I love doing speaking, commitment addresses. I love actually working with big corporate clients and with nonprofits and helping advance them from where they are to where they desire to be. And I have a training and consulting business where I really work with um, C-suite executives on high performance management for their teams, for themselves. I do a lot of corporate training. I am certified in housing and economic development, by the way. So I hold a national certification for economic and for housing development. I also am a certified DISC trainer and Myers-Briggs trainer. I um, also teach and have certifications in mediation and in strength development. So I use all those certifications and just recently got certified for board and commissioner. So I use all those certifications in my business to help serve the different needs that the community has. So I made sure that it was broad yet specific to organization and development, as well as personal and professional growth in general. It allows me to be the Jill of all trades. So I love that flexibility. From an educational standpoint, in addition to the different certifications, I have four degrees. I have a bachelor degree in psychology from The Ohio State University. I have a master's degree from Central Michigan University, and it's an MBA. I have a second master's degree from Strayer University, and it is in digital entrepreneurship. And then I have a PhD from Capella University, and that is in organization and management with a specialization in leadership. So I also like to make sure I use all of the degrees and the content that I've gleaned from them to help serve folks who um, and clients who are I, I do business with, who are my partners. So I've chosen to stay working and have the entrepreneur track on purpose because it fits 
what I love to do right now in my life. And I used to struggle with well, which one am I going to do? Am I going to stay in higher education or am I going to do my speaking and training business? And I had a mentor just as doctor. I'm calling you doctor. And I'm like, give it to me, girl. Let yeah. I'm a speaker. <laughs> PR shared about having great mentors. Mm -hmm. So I had a mentor tell me, why are you struggling so bad with choosing between the two? You've been doing both for years. Just keep doing both. And eventually one may push the other one out the way, but there's no problem doing both if they both are serving what you need them to. And if you're living out your dream doing that. So I took all that stress off the table. I've been, I've been happily doing both. And I will say, one is trying to push the other one out of the way. So that's just what the story is for today. <laughs> yes. You know how I feel about that, Dr. Carter. Yes. <laughs> Equity and inclusion training. And that has skyrocketed with the wake of what's happening in our country right now. Mm -hmm. So just super, super happy to be here. Thank you so much, Dr. Killens, for having us. This is an honor to speak with these young, bright minds. Cannot wait to hear more from you. <laughs> right, we have the president of our entrepreneurship club, Ishak Smith, who's going to ask the next question. You all realize that everybody in this call has gone to school. And I've noticed a lot of Black people have said that going to school isn't for them. So what do you say to those that say that going to school doesn't make you successful? What do you say to those people? Who would you like to ask? Oh, it's in, anybody. Anybody who wants to answer first. I'm sorry. It's, it's, it's a general question. Can you repeat that last part? You said if going to school, I missed the last part of what you asked. Okay, sorry. So I said, uh, what do you say to those who say that going to school doesn't make you successful? Oh, doesn't make you successful. Yes, it, it, does, it doesn't determine your future. What do, what do you say to that? Obviously to each, you know, their own perspective and opinion. I really think it has a lot to do with what you wanna do in life. I really, really do. I'm, I'm an educator. So I can say that I've even felt both ways at times where depending on what you wanted to do, you may need the education to do that. So many things we want to do require a degree or require a certification. A lot of jobs in the market require such. So there are some avenues that are going to require the educational background to support you getting in the door. There are others that do not. And so for those that do not, if you don't feel like it's necessary or needed for you, then charter your own way. You know, just work hard at whatever it is that you want to do so that you can then reap the benefit of that and create your own legacy. Higher education isn't for everyone. It just isn't. Some folks do better with going to the military, some nothing at all. You have to know yourself and know where you can flourish. Because the one thing you don't want to do is go down a path, spend your money, time, resources there, and it not work out for you because you were trying to force the circle into the square. And so it really is an individual perspective, but those are just some varying items to keep in mind when making the decision about education. I'm a lifelong learner, so I'm always going to be a proponent of you can always learn something, but you can learn from others' life as well. Thank you for that. I appreciate that. I agree with the, uh, the comments as well. I think it depends on what are your goals and what area you go into. I went into banking and I had an associate degree at that time when I started in banking at 20 years old. And my mentor told me if I am going to be successful in the finance industry, I need at least a bachelor degree. So I went back to the University of South Carolina. At that time, that was the only school that had night classes. So I went there six years, earned my degree at night, and worked full time during the daytime. Now, I knew that I really didn't learn much from the University of South Carolina. I got a degree, and the week after I finished my degree, I got promoted to vice president. So that particular area, banking is very conservative. They look at your education background.
But on the same note, I have a friend of mine, graduated from Eau Claire High School, never went a day in his life to college. His annual income right now excess of $1.2 million a year. He's mm -hmm. in direct sales. So he knew what he wanted to do and he didn't have that have to have that education to do that. He learned his business from his mentors. So it depends again, but I am like the other speaker. You always can learn something every day. I'm 70 years old and believe it or not, I'm still learning. And I enjoy reading, enjoy history, and nothing can compare to what's going on now than over the last 50 years. So again, it's up to that individual to set those goals and determine what you want to do, dictate how much education you're going to need. I appreciate that. And the only thing I'm going to add is no matter what, if you attend higher education or not, your worth, work ethic has to be on 10. Period. Drop the mic. Yes, ma'am. Appreciate that. That's true. <laughs> All right. Our next question is Jaquel Williams. She is an entrepreneurship major at Allen University. What question would you like to ask? We can't hear you. Okay, can you hear me now? Yes. Okay, so my question is like, what influenced you to become an entrepreneur? And um, as you become like an entrepreneur, like did you, what did you learn new as going into the entrepreneur? So I can, I can start off this question. Um, seeing my, my mother be an entrepreneur and her parents, were entrepreneurs as well. I believe having a legacy of entrepreneurs in the family really does help shape um, if someone even sees that of being an option for life. So for me, I had my grandpa who used to take around, he um, passed away two years ago, but he was 10 days shy of turning 96. And he used to take a block of, a block of ice, go door to door, cut up the ice, for everyone in the neighborhood. Okay, that's, that's, that's old school, right? And then he petitioned to bring the first bank to South Hill, Virginia. So seeing that, and, and he you know, gathered up his money, he used to work in the railroad. He worked at the, in the, on the railroad for 33 and a half years. So every day when he used to come home, he used to pencil in a little bit um, every single night to build a house. And my grandpa did not even finish fifth, fifth grade, but he worked on a farm. And every single night he would work to build and write down the house that he was building for his family. And he eventually within his lifetime built six homes himself. Wow. Built, and I told you, he didn't even, I don't even think he went to the fourth grade. My grandpa could not read or write. My grandmother would read things for him and tell him, Sally, sign here. But knowing that, that legacy, that lineage from where I come from, which is where you come from, make sure that I and my husband, we get better and better every single year, right? So knowing my legacy and my family um, and from, where, from whence they came, make sure that I get better and better and help others and influence their lives to be entrepreneurs as well and not just relying on someone else for a paycheck. Because you never know. They may change their business strategy and you're out of the job. But if you have a way to make some extra money for yourself and your family, you're set for life. Nobody can dictate your life. And my grandpa always said that to his kids and therefore my, my mother and then my father used to always tell that to us as well. I'm going to ask that you all would pause after, um, before the next two speakers respond to that question 
because we are using Zoom. And so we need to log off and log back on quickly if you can. And when we come back in, Dr. Carter, you can go first and then Mr. Fleming can respond to that question and we'll finish up real quick, okay? Same number, same password? Yes, thank you. Dr. Carter, if you could now respond to the question, thank you. Yes, great question. I, I have to echo with, um, with the other speakers and their sentiments regarding the path to entrepreneurship. I also was fortunate to have family members and friends who were entrepreneurial minded. So I've seen it and be around it growing up my whole life. My dad uh, was a CPA. And so I watched him work really hard to grow his business to the point where he was doing well, you know, and helped our family quite a bit. And just seeing the different paths that people wanted to take, I agree that it gives you the ownership like no other to own your own journey, your own path, to create legacy for you, your family, and your friends. You have the power and influence to do that as an entrepreneur. You get to shape the world. And, and it is just such an amazing feeling to be in that space. The other thing that's encouraging about being an entrepreneur is knowing that your grit, your grind, your work pays off and it's for you. It is so um, customary to work so hard, you know, for every and anybody else. And I'm not knocking that at all. It just feels great when you're doing it for yourself and when you know the end goal that's in mind for why you're doing it you get to control what comes in and you get to control how it goes out and so it's just wonderful to see the seeds that you plant and nourish grow into fruition all by the hard work of your hands and by using the intellectual capital that you have in your mind and so i i will tell you there's just nothing like it and you do work hard you have to stay on your A game and you are going to have to jump through hoops that maybe others don't have to, but you have to keep in mind that it's worth it. And you have to always tell yourself as you're going along that journey that you have come too far to turn back and you're too close to give up. And so stay on that grind because it is worth it in the end. Mr. Fleming. Okay. Um, First, you have to make the decision that you want to be an entrepreneur. And everyone is not cut out to be an entrepreneur. Now, if your goal is one, to own your own business, you got to understand what comes along with that. I worked in banking for 30, almost 40 years. I know I had a check coming in every week. When you're an entrepreneur, that check comes in, you may not feel good, so good today, but if you don't go and do what you're supposed to do, that check may not come in. Whereas if you're in corporate America, you can get a couple of days here and there. So you have to have that attitude that you really want to put in the effort. All of us see people that I was just looking at, and I'm changing the subject a little bit, Lil Wayne last night on TV. And you sit there and you listen to that and you say to yourself, God, if this guy can be a multimillionaire, what the hell is wrong with me? Okay, so, but, he had something that somebody wanted. You are paid one third of what you are what you are worth in corporate America. If you're making thirty thousand dollars, you're worth ninety. Okay, so you got to keep that. The only way you can get your worth if you own your own business. But it's a lot to come along with that, and you got to be willing to put in those efforts to make that happen. I think um, I just really do want to um, dig in because I know so much of each of your backgrounds 
and how profound your experience has, have been. So, but I, in the same breath, I know we need to respect your time. So I'm gonna ask each of you in two minutes or less, if you had to, um, and I'm gonna feed off of something that I heard Mr. Fleming say earlier, and I'm gonna let him start by answering this question first. You said at the end of the day, no matter what your educational background, it should be the goal of every African-American to own their own business. Yes. Can you elaborate on that and, and give our students a, a, a nugget of wisdom that would ignite them to chase after entrepreneurship harder than any job that might be offered to them? Okay. Uh, first of all, regardless, uh, I can give you a formula that over experience of 50 years that I have proven over and over it works. Regardless of what you do, 80% of it, you show up. To get that to 85%, show up on time. To get it to 90%, develop a plan. To get it to 95%, set goals. And 100%, achieve those goals. And I guarantee you, whether you stay in corporate America or you start your own business, those five points will make you successful in life. Why do you want to be an entrepreneur? You can have value in your community. If you've got a company that hire other employees, our president now saying that he didn't pay taxes, but the people he hired paid millions and millions of dollars in taxes. Now, one thing you got to understand as a business owner, you can be careless and your employees will be the only one that making money. You may not make any money. And if that's your goal, it's not a good goal, okay? Everybody got mad several years ago when Bob Johnson sold, a lot of black folks got mad because Bob Johnson sold BET. Where can you make over $2 billion and still own over 30% of the company? You see, you have to have it exit strategy involved regardless of what you do. You got to figure out a plan how you're going to exit and with money. If you got a business and you know you don't have any kids or your kids don't want to go into your business, then you got to develop an exit plan. How are you going to get the money that you invested over the years in that business? Those are things that we don't do as entrepreneurs, especially in the black community. We are scared we let everybody else tell us what we should do and what we shouldn't do. We got to take a little bit more risks, but you got to be able to weigh those risks. And or can you handle that if it does not be successful? Many people try things for 10, 15 times before they end up being successful. Can you do that? Do you want to do that? Thank you. Ms. Payar, you're next. Okay, so say the question for me one more time. Just give them your best pitch to push them into entrepreneurship. Okay, so I would say it's being able to have a sense of peace. Knowing you have something that you can create on your own and you can make it small, medium, or large, but it's yours. And going along with that, I, I am going to give a couple tips that I just think everyone, um, because I just loved, um, I just loved his tips, Fred, right? Okay, I just love that. I, I took notes because we're all, right? School is never out for the pro. So I would say along with his tips, 
is pray over that plan. Okay, so all of that, pray over it. Okay, talk to the good Lord, tell him to bring you the right customers, the right business partners to help you with your business. And then I would say, have some type of affirmation that that self-talk is so key because you're gonna get knocked down, but as long as you know the desire in your heart that comes from the Lord, then he will guide your path. But that path that the Lord told you is just for you. Nobody, the Lord didn't tell your mama to pay the path. He told you. So you have to affirm yourself who God made you to be, to know that you were meant for a time such as this. Okay, so affirm yourself and pray over your plan and seek your mentors. They may look different than you, but you have to seek, go seek and find. If you want to be a part of this and that, go seek someone who is a part of that and ask for their mentorship. You will be surprised how many people will say yes. It's just nobody has ever asked right? So you have to have the desire so great in your heart to seek what you want. So that being entrepreneurship, I think it's fantastic because the sky is truly the limit. Nobody can ever tell you that you cannot go here or there because it's yours. It's your business. Thank you. And Dr. Carter, I dropped the mic on all of that. <laughs> it was real. It was beautiful. Real. Yes. Add, other than just keep hold of your passion and never lose why you wanted to become an entrepreneur. Because that's what's going to get you through the challenging times. So you have an inner flame that's inside of you that's driving you to entrepreneurism. Don't ever let that flame die out. Keep it ignited with the self-talk, with the praying. I love the, the saying that I have on my wall and on the shirt. It says, wake, pray, and slay. Mm. Wake up with a solid, good mind about that fire burning. Pray about how to keep it lit, about getting the right customers, all that, and slay your hearts out. Work harder than you've ever worked before because it is worth it. It is yours. You own it and no one can take it away from you. And, and, and you are going to have dips and valleys. You may try several businesses, but don't stop. Keep going. If you have that burning desire to be an entrepreneur, don't ever stop. Don't ever give up and learn from those things that didn't happen the way you planned. Learn from them and then grow from them. So strategize and then execute and stay consistent with that. Thank you so much for this opportunity to speak with you all. I just want to say thank you on behalf of myself. We've been texting behind the scenes of my students. I want you all to know that you have been so inspiring to them and they're excited about just being here in the presence. And I am grateful for each and every one of you who come into my life in, in a different way and that inspire me on a regular basis in a different way, whether it's um, my accountability partner, the one who talks junk to me and tell me what I'm not doing, the one who encourages me in a church environment. Each one of you have such a uh, distinct role in the life of Dr. Killens. And so I want to say thank you for showing up, not just for me, but for Allen University and the students who are still craving something. And I just want to close with saying that I too have a history in my family of entrepreneurship. And I know that is what has drawn me. I have um, that, that story of a great grandma who was the community midwife and had the community store and owned the farm and owned land galore. And I also know the story of a family who didn't understand that value in keeping that wealth. Um, Ishaq, his, his actual pro um, project for his um, capstone for his degree is in looking at the wealth gap. 
in the African-American community. And I believe in my heart that this is the thing that closes the gap. And so I thank you all for coming in and inspiring our students to jump in and do their part to close that wealth gap. And I close with my favorite quote. Thomas Edison said, opportunities are often missed because they come dressed in overalls and they look like work. You all have an absolutely wonderful day and thank you again. Thank you. My name is Brenda McCoy and I'm a sophomore here at Allen University and I'm a part of the Women in Business organization here at the school. Um, some of the things to start off that we do as an organization here on campus, we attend speaking events, we attend social events, and we attend conferences. Anything that has to do with business or is involved with business things, that's what we try to attend or we do attend. Um, just in February, we had an event where we had women come, anyone that wanted to come, any women that wanted to come and get help starting their resume, or we taught them the proper business attire that you should wear whenever you enter a business or anything. We also taught them how to do the professional photos, the professional, professional emails, sorry. We basically helped them get started on everything that they needed that is involved in a business error or things that they may need it to start their business or do their business or if they're involved in the business, just anything in general, which helped a lot of people. It was very helpful for me. So yeah, I know it helped a lot. So this is definitely an organization that you would want to join if you want to start your own business or if you're in a business already. This is something that you would want to take the time out to join because it's going to help you more in the long run and it's very effective and very helpful. My name is Charles Leland Kinlaw Jr. My name is Robert Allen Yates Jr. I'm the current vice president of the Premier Alpha Upsilon chapter of Phi Beta Lambda Business Fraternity Incorporated. Phi Beta Lambda Business Fraternity Incorporated prides itself on business leadership. We surround ourselves with three significant concepts, community service, education, and the progression of students. A few examples would be resume building, preparing students for the outside world, and helping them with scholarships and grants. The good thing about Phi Beta Lambda is you do not have to be a business major. For example, I am a social science major, and even though I'm not a business major, this fraternity has helped me out immensely. Thank you and have a good day. Be blessed. Hello, my name is Ishaq Smith. I major in business with concentration in entrepreneurship. Now, I'm also the president of the Entrepreneurship Club. So the purpose of this club is to give people the chance to see entrepreneurs and how they got to that point in becoming their own boss. Now, to join this club, you have to be a business major. You could be that major in the math, biology, pre-law, but as long as you have that mindset, to start your own venture and, and branch out and start your own hustle, you're welcome to join us. So please contact me or contact Dr. Killings, who is the advisor, and don't hesitate to join us. Thank you. Uh, one of our guests, uh, speakers for this seminar, uh, Mr. Marlon Glenn. And uh, he's going to share with us uh, all his experience and background and as a sports administrator. Uh, but in the meantime, the first thing is to recognize and own him because uh, as South Carolina, uh, South Carolinians, uh, he is one of us. Uh, he graduated from University of South Carolina, Aiken, uh, before uh, proceeding with his career uh, as a lawyer. He actually pursued the international uh, law aspect, so he went to London, but I will let you hear him elaborate on that aspect. Uh, but the, the most important part uh, for this seminar is that uh, Mr. Glenn has a lot to share with our students uh, that we can relate to, especially in, the, uh, in his background with uh, be, being knowledgeable about different aspects and working in different areas. He never lost his passion for sports. Um, of course, you're also going to hear him, uh, his experience with playing uh, as a student athlete at USA and uh, also as a national team player for Grenada. Uh, but he has spent a lot of time and is currently working as the director for FIFA. Uh, which is the uh, international body that governs uh, soccer in the World Cup. So FIFA, again, 
for those that are, may not be familiar, is a Federation for International Football. So he's representing the Caribbean area uh, that looks after about, I think it's 28 countries that he's responsible for and uh, a budget that is over a hundred million. So uh, he has a lot to offer our students and I'm looking forward to uh, everybody listening and tapping into his knowledge and what he brings and shares with our students. Thank you. Good morning, Mr. Marlon Glean. We thank you so much for making time for us here um, to share your experiences with us um, the Allen University family, and specifically our Allen University students. Uh, um, so we're going to just start with asking you some basic background questions. Um, can you tell us about where you went to college, what degrees you've obtained, and um, how you started? Okay, so um, I'm from a, a little island in the Caribbean called Grenada. Um, and um, while there, I played soccer for Grenada's youth national teams. Um, I got the opportunity to go to college on a soccer scholarship to St. Francis College in New York. Um, it was a Division I college, um, participating in Northeast Conference. Um, I played one season there, and then I transferred to University of South Carolina, Aiken, where I completed the last three years of my um, college um, my bachelor's degree. Um, while at USC Aiken, I was the captain of the soccer team. I was the most valuable players on, on two occasions. Um, additionally, again, I was also a member of the student athlete advisory committee during that period. Um, but also while I was at the University of South Carolina Aiken, I was also representing Grenada at the senior men's national team level. So uh, during that period, I was participating in the FIFA World Cup qualifications, the Caribbean Cup tournaments, and CONCACAF, CONCACAF tournaments. Um, I got a degree in uh, business management or business administration with focus on finance and marketing. Uh, marketing has always been uh, a part of me, something that came easily. That's why I chose that. Um, I remember uh, clearly that one of my professors was trying to convince me to be an accounting major because I was doing so well in accounting, but I just had a thing for marketing. So I ended up doing a degree in marketing. Um, after my degree, um, I, I went back to Grenada to, to prepare for World Cup qualifying. That was the 2001 World Cup in Korea and Japan. Um, so I went back to Grenada to tra train with the national team and to play in quali qualifying games. Once Grenada got knocked out, um, I went to Major League Soccer, um, to Miami Fusion, just to some training camp stuff. And during that period, they were offering small contracts. I think for a rookie player, he was going to make like $24,000 a year. Um, the same time, I had a friend at uh, UBS in New York who said, hey, with your business degree, um, you can get a job in my office and you can start at, I think, like 36K at the time. And that was the end of my soccer career. Um, I went to UBS and I was there for three and a half years as a profit and loss analyst um, in the legal department. And while working in corporate America, I realized that this wasn't something I wanted to do. So um, a friend of mine tried to convince me to do law. She said to me that um, she always felt that I was going to be a lawyer, although I never saw it, never dreamt about it. My, my dream was always to play professional soccer. Um, so I applied to law schools in the UK because my plan was to move back to Grenada. Uh, I got accepted at the University of Leicester. But after I got accepted, I realized that I was out of school for about four years and I wasn't sure I was ready for, for law school. So um, I took a job at Oneonta State University in New York, where I was the assistant coach uh, on the soccer team, they played Division One soccer. And I was also teaching two or three, three classes. Um, I think one on like health science. Um, I think one in like women in sports or women in soccer or something like that. And um, another one. Um, and I took a year there. I did really well. As a matter of fact, it was the, uh, the school performed best in soccer in uh, in 38 years, I think 
I think um, at some point we were ranked in the top 25 in the country. Uh, and that's NCAA Division One, and um, I think we just, we barely missed out on the on the NCAA playoffs that year. And after that year, I figured I was ready for law school, so I picked up, went to the UK. I did a, a degree in law. Um, I completed it in it's a the law degree in the UK is a three year program. I was able to complete it in two years because I had a first degree. Um, and then I went on to do the bar in the UK. Now, the bar in the UK is completely different from the bar in the US. In the US, you take a, an exam and you pass the bar in New York State or, or, or Georgia or South Carolina. In, uh, in England, you have to do one year, uh, an entire year course, um, probably about 13 or 14 courses throughout the year, and you must pass all the courses in order to be called to the bar. Um, if you fail any one, you had two chances to reset. And if you failed it, then you were will not be you would not be able to be a barrister at law, which is what I am. So um, I got called to the bar in the UK, and then I I went to Grenada and got called to the bar in in Grenada. So I can practice right now in the UK and I can practice in Grenada. Um, I moved back to Grenada in uh, 2007 and worked. Uh, in private practice for for about a year, 2007-2008, and then uh, no, uh, I, I moved back in 2008 and worked as a in private practice 2008 to 2004, yeah, 2007 to 2008, and then um, there was a, a financial firm in 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 uh, it's an Austrian financial firm in Grenada that was looking for a general counsel. Um, I got the job there, so I was responsible for all aspects of law, including litigation, because I went to court a couple of times. Um, I did that for two years, 20, 2008 to 2010. And then after that, um, the government asked me if I can move to the foreign ministry to set up a legal department in the foreign ministry. So I moved to government, and I was the head of the legal department in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and International Business. So I advised the government of Grenada on all aspects of international law, um, any arrangement with any countries. Um, I did a lot of work at the UN in New York, at the UN in Geneva, in Geneva, Switzerland. Um, any arrangement with uh, boundary delimitation. One time Grenada was trying to determine the boundary with Trinidad and Tobago. I had to advise the government on that. Um, uh, arrangements with the Organization of American States, OAS, um, arrangements with the Commonwealth, uh, the Commonwealth Group of Countries and the Commonwealth Secretariat. Uh, I would advise the government on arrangements there. Um, I did stuff on law of the seas, on environment law, on, uh, on uh, disarmament. A matter of fact, one of the biggest treaties that was signed at the UN happened in 2012 and I was part of the treaty negotiation. I represented, the, I was one of the Caribbean negotiators at the UN um, for the arms trade treaty, the ATT, which is probably one of the largest uh, treaties to be signed in, in this century. Um, it regulates the trade in conventional weapons uh, throughout the world. Um, there are a number of countries who were against it, including uh, the Iran, Iraq, uh, most of the communist countries. Uh, even the U.S. was very hesitant at first, but at some point they came around and signed it. But um, I did a lot of work all over the world, from Africa to South America to Europe, um, advising, working with the U.N. and advising the government of Grenada on various international law matters. Um, after four years in government, I moved back to the U.S., and worked at, uh, with New York State at the of, of uh, Office of Children and Family Services, where I was, uh, oh, I don't remember that position, but um, I investigated complaints of discrimination within the, within the state, uh, within the state system at all the, the juvenile detention centers, et cetera. Um, then I moved on to, I was only there for about a year because I just came back to New York and that was the first job I got. Okay. <laughs> um, then I moved to the University of University of Albany in New York, upstate New York, and I was the assistant director in the Office of Diversity and Inclusion. Again, um, I investigated all um, uh, 
complaints of discrimination, um, whether it's faculty, staff, students. Um, I was the one who would have um, done all the investigations and conclusions. And um, we had a famous case during my time there where some black girls said they were uh, discriminated against by some white guys. As a matter of fact, Hillary Clinton had mentioned it on the campaign during 2016. Um, I was the one who had to investigate that, that matter, but then after a while it became a police matter and they took it away from me and they made their own decisions. Um, I was totally against the, the, the ruling. I didn't think uh, the police got it right, but um, anytime you get a chance, you can Google it about uh, some girls on a bus, on a, a, a capital district bus, in Albany, New York, who claimed that some white guys uh, racially discriminated against them. That became a police matter. The girls were expelled, which I thought was the wrong decision, but the police decided that way and the university decided that way. Um, and it was a big deal. It was a big deal on the campaign. That was the, the whole, the, the hype of the, the start of the whole Black Lives Matter movement. So they were at the university and protesting every night. It was a really big deal. So I was in the center of that. Um, and I left the university. I went to GE, General Electric, and I was a contract administrator. And I thought I was going to be there for a long time. And then FIFA called. And FIFA called and said they were going to office, open an office in Barbados and they want me to come in and manage it because, um, because of my, my past soccer history. <clears throat> so um, Can you tell us what FIFA is? FIFA is the world governing body for soccer. So every country in the world who plays soccer is governed by this international organization called FIFA. Um, and FIFA makes the rules. Uh, FIFA governs the, the area. Um, um, any organized soccer in the country, so for example, in the US, um, you know, there's travel soccer and there is rec soccer. All these things come under US soccer. But U.S. soccer comes on the CONCACAF, which is the regional grouping. Uh, FIFA has five confederations. So CONCACAF is the one responsible for North America, Central America, and the Caribbean. And um, so U.S. soccer is part of Con CONCACAF. And then every country in the world, there are 211 FIFA members. They all um, come under FIFA. So sanctions, FIFA can sanction a country. Uh, FIFA can ban a country. And if you're banned, you will not be able to play in international matches. You will not be able to play in the World Cup, etc. So um, I'm responsible for the development of soccer throughout the Caribbean. So in 28 countries in the Caribbean, I manage, meaning that um, I provide support, funding, etc. for the development of soccer. I provide guidance. Um, I advise uh, soccer federations on how they should go about hiring different aspects of the administration. So for example, coaches, uh, accountants, um, medical personnel, um, and also provide funding for infrastructure. So the building of stadiums or the building of uh, uh, fields, um, buses, so then purchasing buses for the national teams, uh, whatever is considered development from the Football Federation or Soccer Federation, then um, I come in and provide the, kind of the support they need um, so that they can continue to develop soccer in the in their respective uh, territories. So I've been here for the last three, just over three years. Um, it's a lot of traveling. I'm literally on the road like every week. Well, that was pre-COVID. Um, since COVID, I've been stuck in Barbados. So most of my, my meetings, like today, I have about six meetings online um, with different countries, um, providing advice on different, on different, in different areas. So every country has different issues, and I'm responsible for uh, solving those issues. You have had a very robust career. <laughs> And I, I think it's wonderful. So as I was listening to you, I, I heard so many wonderful things that I want to um, help elaborate on. You, you spoke about, um, it sounds like mentorship, faculty who saw what you were good at, but, um, and they tried to guide you. So talk to the students about how important it is to recognize the people who, and connect to faculty who see something more in you than just the athlete and um, 
And then also you talk about the fact that you love marketing or finance more than the accounting. So you, you had to know not just what you were good at because you were good at both, but what you love even outside of soccer. So yeah. just a little bit about that. So I'll even go back further to my high school days in Grenada. Um, in high school, I was always the soccer player. That's how I consider myself. But at my school, they considered me the student because I was a decent student. So teachers would see me as an example to other students because I was good academically. But for me, my track was always going to be soccer. I never saw myself being an academic. Um, so I remember I was recognized in front of the school for my academic achievements. Um, I remember teachers trying to guide me into different areas, telling me what I should be. Um, I, I remember teachers speaking highly of me uh, to other people, to strangers sometimes, and I wasn't aware of um, if I was good enough or how good I was. Um, but they saw, they saw a lot of things in me. Um, I remember even going back after I graduated from college in the U.S. and going back to Grenada. Musk, I would visit my old teachers at my high school in Grenada, and they would literally celebrate me. And I didn't think it was a big deal. But um, it's critical that you have that connection with individuals who take a liking or, or, or see something in you. It's very critical. And I'll go back to that FIFA job in a bit because it's, it's again, it, re it relates to what you're asking. Um, at college in the US, we had an accounting class and every day, myself and three other guys, we would meet up and practice accounting. That was the first time I'm taking accounting ever because I didn't do accounting at high school. And, um, and we were doing really well. And every exam I would get an A and then um, the teacher, I don't remember her name right now, but she always comes to say to me that um, you need to be an accounting major. And I keep saying to her, accounting is too much work. And I got soccer. And, um, and marketing was something that from Grenada, it came easy for me. I did not have to put in too much. Um, I was always that guy. When I was in my youth club, when I, when I, when I was playing soccer, when we had to do fundraising, when we had to do promotion of our club, I was the guy who was doing that without even thinking I was marketing in anything. I was, we'd have uh, fundraisers and none of the guys would contribute. We'd have all these donation sheets where we go around trying to get uh, solicit donations to buy uniforms, etc. And I would come back with three, four hundred dollars and the rest of the guys on my team would come back with zero. They never picked up the people. But later on, I realized that that was marketing. I was going out and selling my team and selling what we did and selling our achievements. And in return, uh, people from the public was giving me funds. I would get $20 donations, $30. And I was like, we were like 10, 11, 12 years old. So marketing was always an easy something for me. I was really good at selling. I was really good at, at promoting, uh, promoting myself, promoting my team, etc. So when I got to the U S and I went to college and, and this professor was trying to make me an accountant major. A matter of fact, two of the guys eventually um, became accountant major. Okay. And I was the one who went to marketing and finance. Um, and every time she told tell me I'm making a mistake, you should be an accountant. And um, that did not happen. But um, she saw it in me. Um, even in pre before I went to South Carolina, I was at uh, St. Francis for a year. And we had a psychology professor and she was trying to make me be a psychology major. And I told her that that was not going to be my, that was not going to be me. Um, but fast forward, um, networking is critical, especially in the sports industry, um, in every industry, but especially in the sports industry. So let me give you a story about how I got this FIFA job. It's 2013 and I was invited to attend the Gold Cup. The Gold Cup is the, is the major championship for CONCACAF, the confederation that controls North America, Central America, and the Caribbean. And, um, and uh, it's all the presidents of football federation or soccer federations from around the confederations, North America, Central America, and the Caribbean, um, were invited. And I got a special invitation from the president at the time. 
and I was there and uh, one, I met this guy. Uh, he was a black guy, African guy. Um, and we just started this weekend. I didn't know him. He didn't know me. And uh, we started talking about, you know, what I did, etc. cetera. Um, and he had an accent. He was actually born, he was actually from the Democratic Republic of Congo, but uh, he grew up in France. So I think he moved to France when he was probably nine or 10 years old. I went to high school and college in France and he was a lawyer. So, so we had the connection. I was an attorney, he was an attorney and we both were involved in soccer. And he was working at UEFA at the time and UEFA is a confederation for Europe. So CONCACAF is a, is a confederation for North America, Central America and the Caribbean. UEFA is the, is the Confederation for Europe. And um, he was head of the legal department. And, um, and we started talking about soccer and, 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 um, and, and law and how he got involved in soccer. And, um, and that was 2013. And, um, and then 20, uh, we didn't speak for a while. We would exchange probably emails once a year or so. And in 2016, 2016, end of 2016, he was like the last quarter of 2016, he gave me a call and said, hey, um, I'm now at FIFA and I'm head of this big department that, that controls all the soccer federations around the world. And, um, and we are about to open an office in the Caribbean. And I was thinking that you're the only person that can do this job. And um, he said that they're gonna, they're gonna advertise the position soon and you should apply. So um, they advertised the position. So I kept looking on the website. They advertised the position about a couple of weeks after. And I applied. And um, he was one of the persons I had to interview with. But additionally, I had four additional interviews, including his boss and um, some other higher level individuals. Um, for this position here, there was over 500 applications from all over the world. As a matter of fact, there was over 300 applications from Europe. Um, and you would think uh, a European, it's, 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 that's where soccer is, is, is big. And um, most of these people are, are probably really qualified in soccer, et cetera. But um, I was able to get a job. And the reason I was able to get a job was that I brought so many different uh, facets to the, to the, posi put to the position. Um, I played soccer. I played international soccer. Um, I, I, I was a lawyer, so I bring a legal um, aspect to the, to the position. I had a finance background. Um, I, was a, I was a vice president of the Grenada Soccer Federation at some point. Um, I worked at, with government of Grenada in international relations. Um, so I had about five or six different, um, different things that was working for me compared to someone who would have a strict soccer background or someone who would have a strict uh, law background. Um, so what I'm able to do here, a matter of fact, I'm, 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 uh, from time to time, we get so many different things on my desk where, for example, we may have to, ha like just yesterday, we had a matter where uh, they were asking me if we should get an attorney to deal with a matter in Barbados. And uh, I was able to take care of it without, we, without FIFA having to source an attorney. Uh, because it was a simple matter that I just explained it to them. And then um, I called the relevant authority in Barbados and was able to take care of it rather than going to the Supreme Court to defend the matter that, that we'd have spent hundreds of thousands of dollars and did not even uh, warrant it because I was able to take care of it. So um, I think I, I was able to, to add to, to FIFA something that very, uh, not too many people could, could add to FIFA. Well, additionally, the networking was the most important part because this guy saw me, we had a regular conversation. He's never seen me before. And in two minutes, he formed an opinion that I was able to, I would have been the perfect guy for this position. Um, so networking is critical. Uh, so many times that, uh, that someone calls me and asks me if I want to do a job or ask me if I want to serve on a, on a board or ask me to, to speak at an event or, or, or uh, I'm having this conversation with you, but it's something I do quite frequently. A matter of fact, um, there is a medical school in Grenada called St. George's University. And um, they also have a, a undergrad program. 
And uh, on many occasions, they asked me to speak in, your, in the same class, your entrepreneurship class, uh, to be a guest speaker from time to time on, in that class. So um, networking is critical. Um, if there is, uh, I think it, it, it gives you more ad of an advantage to get in a position than, than your resume, than, than anything else that you can qualify for. Um, I think having that relationship, just meeting people and, and not forming an opinion. Um, I met the guy, I could have think he's, you know, he's a black guy, he has an accent, he's African, he probably is nobody. I could have just, uh, just waved him off and keep moving. And today, this position wasn't going to exist. But um, I think as a college student, in, whether you were studying in the US or any part of the world, it's critical that you respect people. It's critical that you listen to people. Um, you never know who, you, who you're speaking with. Um, I've been in tons and tons of different forums. I was at a hotel last time and in Barbados, and I really had a really bad experience with the, with the um, head of the restaurant. And um, she treated, I was, she looked at me and she, she, listened, she heard I had an accent and I was not European and I, I did not have a, my skin color was not what she expected of someone as a guest at that restaurant. And um, she was very rude to me. And I called the manager and the manager was able to speak with her because just the week before we spent a hundred, I spent a hundred thousand US dollars at that, at that hotel because we had a major conference there. And after that, the entire hotel wanted to, uh, to apologize and they wanted to ask her to apologize to me, which I did not accept. Um, but it just shows that she, she looked at me and she formed an opinion mm -hmm. that I, I'm a nobody because at that rest, at that hotel, she didn't expect someone like me to be sitting there or, or, or ordering from, from our restaurant. Um, and from time to time, I come across that. And from time to time, um, we have this bias in us. You listen to a guy and he has a Caribbean accent or he has an African accent and we think he's probably a nobody. And um, you'll be surprised as to some of these people you meet by just having a conversation that are PhDs and are, are heads of governments. And, are, and I, I, run, I run into these people all the time, whether I'm on a plane somewhere, um, everywhere. Um, I'm, let me give you a joke, actually. I was on a flight going to St. Thomas in the U.S. Virgin Islands a couple, like two years ago. And this, this guy was sitting next to me and he's like, hey, what are you doing here? And I'm like, you know, I'm working with FIFA and I'm visiting the association. Never seen this guy before. And I say, what do you do? He said, yeah, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a trade unionist and, um, and I'm running to be the governor of, of, of the U.S. Virgin Islands. I'm like, no way. I say, how's that going? He said, it just started, but it's slow. And the incumbent been there for a million years and it's going to be difficult to beat him, but he thinks he's going to win. So I got to St. Thomas and I spoke with the guys at the soccer federation and I said, do you know this guy? And they say, yeah. He said, and I said, he said he's running for governor of the U.S. Virgin Islands. And they say, yeah, he has no chance. He just, he just, he's a nice guy, but he doesn't have a chance. The incumbent is going to win. He's been there for 30 years or whatever. And then uh, fast forward about a year later, or eight months later, I got a call saying that the guy is governor of the, universe, of the U.S. Virgin Islands. That's beautiful. And um, funny enough, I had a meeting with, with soccer and the government sometime last year. And um, he saw me and he remembered me. And he said, you remember that story <laughs> on that plane? And it was a short plane ride, maybe 20 minutes over from uh, St. Thomas to St. Croix. And um, we, we had a laugh about it because everybody wrote him off. He said, he said everybody thought that I was going to lose, but... He said nobody understood the, the uh, everybody underestimated the vote of the, the youth population. And he went after them through social media, whereas the incumbent was an older guy who did his traditional canvassing and, 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 um, and he went social media and went straight to the youth population and was able to win handsomely. So again, I cannot emphasize how important it is to network. I cannot emphasize how important it is to keep those relationships with professors, with individuals in your communities, because at some point you may need to make that call. And that person is going to know everything about you. That person is going to be able to sell you. And, um, and it's very important that you, you, you groom those relationships 
you manage those relationships, and at some point you may able, you may be able to use those relationships. Thank you um, for that wonderful insight into networking and um, and relationship building. I think that that is a major part of the the interpersonal skills that we're trying to help develop in our students and in in our athletes. So I want to ask you, going back to that foundation in soccer, um, and I heard you talk about all the leadership roles you had even in college um, that were outside, connected to soccer, but outside of the classroom. Talk about some of the other skills that you developed as an athlete that have been your foundation in your um, career as a lawyer and in all these wonderful opportunities that have come your way. Um, most importantly, discipline. Um, from playing soccer, from waking up at 5 a.m. for training, uh, for training two, three times a day, uh, I think that instilled a level of discipline in me. So now in my, in my career now, it becomes easy. Um, it doesn't take a lot for me to sit down and just get into some work without procrastinating without um, making excuses um, about time, about uh, weather conditions, whatever it is. Um, also, a matter of fact, most another important factor is uh, time and time management. Um, leaving the Caribbean, I'm not sure if you've been to the Caribbean before, but everybody operates on a very slow time. Um, at eight o'clock events starts at nine. Um, so I, I came to the U.S. with this uh, laser fair attitude um, that if it's 9 o'clock, probably I should get there at 9.30. Um, but quickly at college, my coach was able to cut that out of me. I remember the first day um, showing up for training. And um, I think training was at 4. And about 5 past 4, I was walking down to the training field. And I, I saw my teammates already getting ready. And I'm walking down to the field and then the coach drives past me and gets to the field and everybody see him coming and everybody gets ready and everybody's on the field. And I'm taking my time and I'm walking down because I figure if I'm five minutes late, it's not that bad. And I got to the field and he said to me, um, what time is it? And I said, about four o'clock. He's like, no, go back home. And I was never, ever late for a soccer activity. I was never late for a class. I was never late again just because of that experience because I felt so bad. Um, look, this is me. I'm a leader on the team, and I'm strolling down at 5 past 4 for a 4 o'clock practice. And, um, and, and that, that day, my entire focus on time, my entire respect for time changed immediately, and that never happened again. Um, so time, discipline, um, camaraderie, uh, relationship building. Um, I've played on many teams um, throughout my life. Um, I remember in Grenada, I was the only, I was from the country part of Grenada. And um, on all national teams that I played on, most of the players came from the capital city. Um, so we would come from the country and, um, and there were a lot of stigmas attached to the country that, um, we spoke bad, that we were poor, um, that, um, we were, they call it wild, but in reality, we're talking about very physical when we played soccer. So we had to put up with that. And then the, once they, once the players figured that you can actually play, then that's when you got respect and that's when you, you got into the, the team. But prior to getting into the team, you really had to prove yourself and prove that you're a very good soccer player. And no matter what, where you came from or no matter your accent, because in a little place like Grenada, it's probably like 10 or 15 different types of accents. So you had to prove that no matter how bad your accent was or no matter how poor your community was, or no matter what stigma was, was, was on your community, that you're actually a good soccer player and you were, you were um, good enough to be part of the team and good enough to represent your country just like anybody else. Um, when I went to South Carolina, when I went to New York at, um, at St. Francis College, we literally had about 
14 or 15 countries represented in a, like a 25 man team. Uh, we had players from Argentina and Colombia and Jamaica and, and Israel and, and England. And uh, we had players from all over the world. And um, to fit in, you had to be able to have conversations. You have to be able to learn about people's culture and their language and, and um, work with some of the players because some of the players were not too academically inclined. So the stronger students had to try to help them because you want them to continue to be academically eligible. So you try to not only focus on your academics, but focus on theirs also. Um, I got to South Carolina and my first year, I, first of all, I got to South Carolina, I had no idea what, where South Carolina was. Um, the coach said, hey, do you want to come to South Carolina? Uh, funny enough, I always thought North Carolina and South Carolina was the same state, but it was the North part and the South part. And um, I said, well, he, said to offer me, <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> he said he was going to offer me a full scholarship. And I was like, well, if you're going to give, offer me a full scholarship, because they were, while I was in St. Francis and I, was, I wanted to transfer because I wanted to get out of New York City, uh, I was being recruited by about three or four different schools. One was uh, Southern New Hampshire University in New Hampshire, which was um, top three or top four um, in Division Two in the country. Uh, that's where uh, Dr. Toddy went. Um, uh, so I was there. As a matter of fact, that's where I met Dr. Toddy in okay. uh, 1996. Um, and uh, Dr. Toddy's friend got the job at Circle N and he said to me, and he played at, at Southern New Hampshire also, and he said to me, why would you stay in Southern New Hampshire in that weather condition? You're from the Caribbean. Why don't you come down to Circle I know? And um, I spoke with a couple of guys and they said they think it's a good idea that I should go to Circle Carolina. And I moved there and I got to Circle I know, and I was the only black guy on the team. And that was a culture shock. I've never been in an environment like that. I've never been in an environment where I was the only odd guy. I was always in an environment where I was one of the popular guys. So it was very challenging for me. And I had to learn to, to, um, to be a good teammate, to learn the culture of most of these guys who were from the South. Um, and first of all, I was coming from Grenada where I never knew what racism was. I, I didn't even know racism existed. I mean, you would see movies about the 1960s and Dr. Martin Luther King and stuff, but Living it in Grenada, we have tourists come in every day and you never thought that there is something called racism. I never thought I was different because of the color of my skin. So I was friends with everybody. And, um, and all the guys, because I was such a good soccer player, all the guys were best friends with me. But I was always reminded from time to time that I was black. And I never knew that. I never figured that. I just figured that I was one of the players on the team. And I had some experiences at college. In, uh, I remember some of the bl my black friends after a while because we got there first, the soccer team, because we have preseason before school starts in the fall. And my entire team were white guys. And, uh, and, uh, and most of the girls on the softball team who was also on campus were their girlfriends. And so I, I just knew that community. And they all accepted me because I was a very good soccer player. That's what I'm thinking. And... Um, and the black guys would say to me, when school started and the black guys started coming, like, how do you, why do you talk to these guys? I'm like, they're my teammates. What do you mean I would talk to, talk to them? And then I remember on a many occasions, I would be standing in the quad area, talking to some of the black guys from my classes, et cetera. And my white teammates would walk past me like they didn't see me. And it never dawned on, pe on, dawned on me until a couple of years after that, they did not speak to me because I was talking to the black guys. But at the time, I was naive. I never knew what racism was. I did not know how to spot racism. I did not know how to, I, I just couldn't accept it because I didn't even know he existed. But um, years later, I'm thinking back about days in college, days in, in Aiken, South Carolina, and I realized I was, I was discriminated against on many occasions, but I just thought it was someone being stupid or someone just just didn't like me maybe. Um, so a lot of times with all this conversation now about race in the US, etc., people ask me if I was if I ever experienced racism. And my answer most of the time is not really. I don't think I did. But 
when you look, when I looked deeply, I saw there were times when I figured that it was racist. Um, and I'm not sure if you want me to go into that, that, that conversation about racism. Uh, one of my biggest, one time I was in, um, one of the guys on my team, we went to play against a school somewhere. I don't remember where it was. And, oh, it was Clayton State, I think it was, in Georgia. Mm -hmm. And um, one, after we finished playing, we were in the locker room, getting ready to get out on the bus. And I saw one of my teammates, a white guy in the room, and he said to me, um, I said, Patrick, it's, let's go. Everybody's leaving. He said, Marlon, you know the black guy on the other team? He also beat me up. And I'm like, he can't beat you up. I said, let's go. I said, just walk with me. He cannot do you anything. So we walking out and there's two black guys in front of the door. One of them played soccer and another tall one, I'm guessing he probably played basketball or something. And I'm walking out and I say, Patrick, let's go with me. Just, they cannot do you anything. And I'm speaking loud so they can hear me. So the guys shake their head and they walked away. So we're on the bus and we're traveling. And then one of the guys said to me, he said, Marlon, you know why um, the guy wanted to beat up Patrick? I'm like, no. He said, Patrick called him the N-word. Oh. I'm like, no way. So I said, after we came up with the bus, I said to all my teammates, I said, from today, all of you guys are racist. I don't care which one of you said it or didn't say it. All of you guys are racist, and I'm not speaking to anybody. So Patrick said, oh, Marlon, can I talk to you? I'm like, no, I don't want to hear you. You're racist. I don't want to hear you. The next morning, he comes to my apartment, and he said to me, um, he said, Marlon, can I please talk to you? I said, okay, Patrick, let me hear what you have to say. He said, Pat, he said, Marlon, I'm sorry about yesterday. You know, that's not me. I'm not racist. My dad has three black guys working for him, whatever. And then he said to me, he said, but Marlon, be honest. There are two types of black people. Mm. So I said, what are you talking about? He said, look at you. You're always well-dressed. You're well-spoken. He said, you're black. But he said, you see those guys with the pants hanging down their butts and whatever, they, they're N-words. I'm like, Patrick, you're racist. I said, this guy who's hang with his pants hanging on his butt and me, we're the same. We have the same skin color. We're the same black people. And he said, no, no, these guys, they always want to beat up people and whatever, whatever. I said, Patrick, these guys are my guys. We're the same people. And he was trying to justify that. And he believed that there were two types of black people. But that was some of my experiences. Um, so can I ask how you overcame continuing to be the teammate with these group, this group of people? Because we have to still work with them every day. Um, we're still going to places and applying for jobs with these people who have these mindsets. So what mindset did you create for yourself to allow you to know that they are who they are, but keep doing what you needed to do to be successful? And that's a good question because it's tough, um, especially uh, with most of you students growing up in the U.S. It's tough because it's something you've lived through. For me, I always focus on the end goal. When I moved to the U.S., my, my goal was to make my mom proud. My mom never went to high school. And um, for me, playing soccer was an opportunity for me to be something for myself because we didn't have the support from, I didn't have the financial support from family. My family was never a family who was in a position to pay for me to go to college. As I said, I was a decent student, but I never, I never ever imagined going to college. That was never something on my radar. A matter of fact, most of the guys who I played national soccer team with in Grenada, they stayed in Grenada and played national team all their lives. And they never went to college. Um, I was fortunate because I got the opportunity. But because I got the opportunity, I was focused. I wanted to make sure that at the end of the day, no matter what, that I became successful, whatever, that, whatever success meant. But... Um, Working with in the, these individuals, and I've, I've had to work with a lot of difficult individuals over the past couple of years. Um, individuals who just hated me because I was, from, I was not from the U.S. As a matter of fact, one of my teammates one time said to me that I need to go back to where I came from because I was not American and I should not be in America. <laughs> I should not be in America. Funny enough, he's one of my big, biggest admirers and biggest fans now on social media. He's always say, you know, great things about me or whatever it is. And that's one guy that told me that 
that there was an N-word and that I should go back where I come from. And, and I just, and it's over a period of time, I just left it alone. And now he's come full circle back and we're cool. And, um, and someone who was saying all this racial stuff to me is now bashing the, the, the former president on social media from time to time about he being a racist, et cetera, et cetera. And this is one guy at college was very racist. I told him at one point he looked at me in my face and said, I need to go back where I come from and I cannot speak English and whatever and whatever else he said to me. But um, you have to dig deep sometimes because sometimes it can be so blatant that you just want to do something or you want to just quit that job or you want to just give up. But sometimes you just treat them with respect, even if they don't respect you. You focus on the work and not on the individual. And you'll see from time to time that they're going to come around because they, they realize that you're ignoring them. They realize that you're not the type of person that they think you are. They realize that they're just stupid and ignorant sometimes. And most of the times they come around. I have worked through some of the most difficult individuals in the US, in Grenada. Um, I've had ex bad experiences in Grenada with uh, individuals who work there because they think I just came back from the US and now I think I'm somebody. And they've been in the system in Grenada for 30 years and I should not tell them how they should do their job because I'm coming back with, uh, with uh, US mentality. Um, and I had to, to be able to coexist with these individuals and work and perform. And, and if you perform at a really high standard, then your work speaks for itself. And then you don't have to be in that conversation explaining yourself or trying to prove anything to anybody. Um, I believe, I always believe that you have to sometimes ignore these individuals and just focus on the ultimate goal, which is to Make sure that you have a, a, a very successful career. Uh, make sure that you, you continue to work because you have a family to take care of. Make sure that you continue to do what you're doing because there are a lot of people who look up to you and they expect a lot from you. And you retaliating, whether it's physically, verbally, or, or, or you um, giving up to some of the, these individuals um, puts you in a position where those, your admirers, your supporters, your fans, the people rooting for you, uh, may even see you as, as a failure because of that one bad move you may make. So it's important that you focus on yourself, focus on what you can do and what you can do best and ignore some of these, most of the time they're just ignorant individuals because a lot of the times they know nothing about you, they don't know you, they just form on, they ju they're just forming an opinion on you based on wherever they come from, uh, what you look like, um, how they grew up, uh, from their home. And a lot of the time, some of them are just stressed out and, and, and in bad positions within their own self or within their family, and they're retaliating. And, and unfortunately, they're retaliating against you, and you cannot control that. So you just have to continue to respect them, even if they disrespect you, even if, even if they're not respectful to you, you just have to respect them and you just have to continue to work with them. And 99% and of the time, they all turn around. And I've seen that, it's, I've proven it. Well, I, I totally agree. Um, I can't, um, could not have articulated a process to get your mind right <laughs> better than what you just shared. So um, I'm grateful for your time. And I know um, you have so many other things you said you need to get to. So I'm going to ask you in just a few minutes, um, it's, it's the last quarter of the game and you're going to inspire our students to win because we're in the last couple of weeks of the semester as well. And so uh, just take a few minutes and share whatever wisdom that you have as we get ready to ex um, exit and just inspire us. <laughs> well, at this period, um, especially this difficult period with, uh, with COVID, with the, the race situation in the US, uh, with the change in weather conditions from climate change, um, we're in a very difficult period in our lives right now. 
um, in the US and throughout the world. Um, we've just seen a very nasty campaign. Um, we have a president who still hasn't given up. Um, what each student should remember is eventually things are going to turn around. Patience is key. It's important that you, it's a process. Everything don't come at the same time. That grade you're, you're working towards, even if you didn't get it this time, you're going to get it the next time around. So you have to keep trying. You have to be focused. You have to be patient. Things come around eventually. No matter how bad the situation is, I've been in some really bad situations. And eventually, things come across. Things changes. Um, nothing stays the same forever. Um, so dig deep. Take a deep breath. Say a prayer. And just believe that things are going to get better. Because eventually it will. Um, I've been on, in, in, in situations where I was ready to give up. But I always remember my ultimate goal. And my ultimate goal is always to make my family happy. Not riches, not, not anything external, not anything physical. My ultimate goal was to be the best individual I can be so that my parents, my family, my community can be proud of me. And, and every time I'm in that position, that bad position, that difficult position, I always remember that it's a process and eventually I'm going to win. And winning is in all of us. It's a matter of time. Do not be down on yourself if you do not win now. Just remember that at some point, it's going to happen. Thank you so much. And I think that everything you have talked about, every opportunity that has come, how diligently you've worked in so many areas, it takes me back to my favorite quote in Everybody knows I, I end almost everything with the Thomas Edison quote that says, opportunities are often missed because they come dressed up in overalls and they look like work. And I think your life that so exemplifies true. that. Thank you so much, Mr. Thank Williams. you. Thank you, Dr. Killen. Mr. Steve Galloway. Steve has a bachelor's degree in business administration from Fayetteville State University and a master's of education from Regency University. His career has included the field of education and the automotive industry. He currently owns the Virginia-based logistics company called Blue Logistics, LLC. Welcome, Mr. Steve Galloway. And Mr. Galloway, I wanna say thank you again for sharing your time with us today. Um, we, we welcome you to our Allen University second annual entrepreneurship conference and um, know that we want you to know just, just how grateful we are. And we're gonna go jump right into it. We wanna know, um, tell us about your background. Tell us about your educational background first. Well, my undergrad um, is from the great Faithful State University. Bronco Pride. You know, you, know, you, know, you, know, you know I had to say that first. Get that in there. And, uh, <laughs> My um, actual major was business admin with a concentration in management. Um, a few years later, um, maybe about 10 years later, I eventually went and received my master's degree in school administration from uh, Regent University in uh, Virginia Beach. Okay. And so now, not only did you attend that wonderful Fayetteville State University, but you played football, right? Yeah, I was a, a student athlete, and uh, I was there um, the entire four years, actually four and a half years. So yeah, I, um, I know both sides of the coin when it comes to you know being an athlete and being a student at the same time. Did you have any aspirations for pro when you were in undergrad? You know, that's always in the back of your mind, but um, uh, realistically, nah. I could, I could see maybe as a possibility going to the Canadian League, but as far as the NFL, I, I didn't think I was, um, you know, I've always looked at that as the guys that are, you know, humongous, and that's not always true, I can tell you that, in today's uh, society. 
You right. know, there are guys that are six feet, um, five, eight, you know, in the NFL right now. It's all about the heart and dedication now. It's not about the size anymore. Okay, so well, with, with that being said, that you might have considered it, but it wasn't your primary focus, do you think that made it easier for you to just transition into a career after college? Um, or did you spend any time exploring that, that desire for pro before you made the decision to go into a career track? You know, I, I had thought about it a few times. I really didn't know really how to get into that arena, especially after college. So um, I had thought about maybe a Canadian league, but really didn't pursue it. Um, the only time I really did a lot of research is when probably 10 years later, my nephew came through and he had the opportunity to um, try out, you know, with the NFL and Canadian League, but other than that, far as myself, no. Okay, so then let's jump into this wonderful career that you've had. Um, can you walk us through your career path up to entrepreneurship, please? I guess I wanna say my first real job out of college was working for Federal Express in Charlotte, North Carolina. I stayed with them for about six years. Um, I knew I wanted a lot more, but, you know, just coming out of college, trying to feel your way out, um, stayed with them in customer service for a while. And then I was actually a carrier. Um, but the whole time while I'm doing all this, I'm thinking about just being an entrepreneur, but just trying to find the right time and the right place to jump out there. Um, from, from, FedEx, or I think it's called FedEx now. Back in the day, it used to be called FedEx Express. Mm -hmm. uh, during that time frame, um, back in 97, I get, uh, got married and um, relocated to the uh, Hampton Roads um, area of Virginia and became an educator, became a school teacher. Uh, during that time frame, I, um, I got what they call a provisional, three-year provisional license. And during that time, I said, well, you know, three years are rolled by before you know it. So I said, if I'm going to stay in this profession, at least let me go get a master. So if I decide I want to be in administration, you know, I'm, I'm ready and able. So that's what I did. I went and got a master's during that time frame. And um, uh, after then, decided, you know, after I got it, that's being an entrepreneur was still, you know, burning in my heart. So I eventually jumped out there. <laughs> so tell us about jumping out there. Well, jumping out there is not for the uh, weak, weak minded people. I can tell you that <laughs> you have to have a lot of dedication. Um, you have to have your plan written down. You have to look at your plan every day, every day. Um, so I guess my first entrepreneur experience was opening up a restaurant. Um, didn't realize it was so tough. I mean, when you, when you go into entrepreneurship, you work 24 hours a day to a certain degree. If you're not in there working, then your mind's working because you're constantly, you know, thinking about things that can make it better. So that didn't last long because restaurant business is extremely hard. And then um, took a turn because I didn't really want to go back into the school system. Um, in the classroom, I said like that, I really wanted to go into child nutrition, be a supervisor over the, um, a certain amount of cafeterias in the school district. And didn't realize uh, that when individuals get those jobs, they never leave, <laughs> never ever leave those jobs. <laughs> into retirement. Uh, the one time I did interview for one of those positions, um, I was told that I did come in second behind a 20 year veteran coming out of the military. But um, after then I knew that I had to, you know, look at some other avenues and, you know, that led me into, you know, having a family and knowing that you had to keep the income coming in. So I went into the auto industry as a general manager. Then, not what I wanted, but I just had to keep a paycheck. I, I, I say it like that. Mm -hmm. Stayed in that industry for about five or six years. Uh, was trying to constantly get out, 
but because you know the demand of the amount of hours they put on you, by the time you do your job responsibilities, you drive home, you're just exhausted. You really can't pursue your dream. So um, I guess my dream really came true is one day I went to work unexpectedly and they told me I no longer had a job. So I a um, little, little shocked, you know, cause I'm trying to figure out how, how am I gonna survive? But, you know, with a strong spouse, you know, saying, hey, we'll make it somehow. Um, that was my first jump in getting ready to be an entrepreneur. So I took what was a, what I felt was a bad situation of not having a job to taking it and turning around to a good situation. So, like I say, I was working for FedEx. Remember when I first started, I had worked long enough to receive a early retirement. Okay. And during that time, the paperwork came in, didn't even know it was coming in, had no idea. Also, I was uh, terminated from my job. So now you get unemployment. So now I put those two together and that's how I came up with enough money to start my first career in, uh, in the trucking industry. So tell us about how you chose um, to start a business in the trucking industry. Well, because uh, we live, I guess, four or five miles from the port. I kept seeing all these tractor trailers come in with these containers. Couldn't understand it because when you stay, I grew up, I guess you, I guess you want to call it the Western part of North Carolina or the inland part of North Carolina. You know, we don't have oceans, you know, where we were. So um, didn't realize so many containers, so many ships come into this area. And guess what? When containers come in, they have to have trucks to have them uh, move after they take them off the ship. So I started investigating that. One thing led to another. I was referred to a gentleman that had been in the industry for the last 25 plus years. He, um, he groomed me on how to work the business. I eventually bought two trucks. I started off with one, but bought two trucks. And um, the rest was history. I, I, I did it for several years. Um, saw the pros and cons of it and decided that um, I didn't really want to stay with the containers. So eventually I moved over to um, uh, car hauling. So currently right now, my uh, vehicles run from, from Virginia area to Florida every week, delivering vehicles to Florida. So you started with transporting items that were bring, um, brought into the port. Correct. And, and now you are transporting automobiles. So you've changed. Correct. You didn't change industries. You just changed Correct. what you transport. Correct. You're absolutely okay. right. Okay. Absolutely right. So how did you recognize or, or what were the factors that made you change? Um, at the end of the week, you know, I had to make payroll. Okay. And that was a deciding factor. You know, you have to pay your employees regardless of what you make at the end. So what I was making, what I was grossing, what I was paying out for payroll, what I was paying out for expenses, and then whatever's left on the bottom, you still can't put all that in your pocket because you still have to think about next week or a month from now and cutting that those funds up. So I didn't think it was beneficial to me. Um, enough financially to keep going. It was a it was a good lesson. Don't get me wrong. It was a, definitely a good lesson to um, jumping over to what I'm doing now. But um, I saw car hauling being a lot more uh, lucrative. Okay. Um, so you you recognized a new opportunity that would bring in more revenue. Absolutely. I love it. So now let's go back to this whole dynamic of of your foundation. So tell me with your foundation as an athlete. Oh, how much of that plays into your success as an entrepreneur? Well, being a former athlete, you have to understand team playing. Um, you're only as good as your people around you. Uh, <laughs> I'm not a person that's a, a truck driver. So I had to bring in other people around that were experts in driving trucks. 
So that's 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 when you start working with your team. Um, start surrounding my people or surrounding myself with people that had like minds, that wanted to be successful. Otherwise, um, you won't be successful. You you have to have people around you that that um, that enjoy what they're doing, along with you know coaching you and 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 bouncing ideas back and forth. You can't you can't you can't work with any any haters. I can tell you that now, no haters whatsoever. But um, just 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 getting up, working hard every day. You know, as far as being an entrepreneur, if you're not gonna get up at the crack of dawn uh, and 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 get your exercise in, uh, get your nutrition in, and um, and and don't forget get your prayer in, because prayer prayer does change things. Trust me, um, you're not gonna be successful. Okay, and so now tell me, um, what are your words of guidance? when you talk to students about choosing um, employment in somebody else's company versus their choice of entrepreneurship as they leave college and they pursue a, a path? I guess if I, you know, I have a 20-year-old a right now and I'm trying to guide him in the right direction. And you have to realize we all make mistakes. We all, but I'm trying to prevent him to make not to make the same mistakes as I did. So I'm trying to show him some ways, uh, different options. I guess if I had to do it all over again, myself personally, and a lot of times when you come out of college, you broke, you don't have any money to start no business, you know, unless you're, unless your parents or someone that's going to lend you the money. But um, I tell any young person right now, collectively try to find yourself first and really what you want to do in life. Um, I'm coaching my son to, I'm going to say coaching, but I'm kind of prepping him to maybe join the military as a second lieutenant coming out of, coming out of college. Travel around the world. You're still in your, your young 20s, 22, 23 years old. Travel around the world a little bit. Experience some things. And then once you come back around, and then decide on uh, what do I want to do in life. Going in as a second lieutenant, it's not, whoops, whoops. I'm Did still here. Up? No, I'm hold still on. here. Hold on, I messed up something. Hold on, hold on one second. I touched the screen. Well, I can still hear and see you. Can you? Okay. All right. No. All right, so um, like I say, joining the military right after school, um, I take my hat off to anybody that does it. I wish I would have done it first. And then <clears throat> use it to your benefit. One thing, you're working for the government off the bat. And then the, the training you learn, let's say if you get in there two, three years, four years, five years down the line, you say, hey, it's just not for me. But guess what? You have that military background behind you. You, um, you can most likely go straight from the military to another government job and keep those years rolling, you know, towards your retirement. So um, I applaud anybody that does that. And then after then, um, and, and some people stay in the military and just make a career, which is nothing wrong with that but let it benefit you where either you jump into a career and with the government or you can use the benefits and start your own business and let the government pay for it. Now that one I must advocate for um, because there are so many veterans benefits, as you said, and programs to help um, veterans become entrepreneurs. Absolutely. So I, I absolutely agree with that. And um, I want to ask you, as we are at the end of the semester and um, our students are, are pushing through and they're still, we're, we're, we're advising and we're trying to draw them in to really stay focused, stay focused in the season of COVID, in the online, in the challenges of a regular semester, in 
um, isolation in the dorms, you know. So what, what would you say to inspire our students to stay focused and to continue to explore opportunities outside the box? One thing I want to say about the pandemic and what we're dealing with right now is that this too shall pass, okay? Um, don't get so caught up in wanting to hang out with your friends and and start continue spreading this um, this virus around. So do what the scientists are saying, your leaders are saying, protect yourself. But after then, um, go out and 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 make the best out of life. Um, I, I kind of repeat the question again because I think I got sidetracked on that. Oh, it's okay. And, um, what, what, what's what's what, throwing me off? I can't see you. Okay. <laughs> that's what's so, throwing me off. <laughs> okay, I'm sorry. But yeah, so I was asking just words of inspiration about what you were just about to say, going out to make the best of life, being willing to look outside of the box. What, what would yeah. be your, your words of inspiration on that? Absolutely. I, I tell anyone, you know, straight coming out of college, um, I hate to promote the military. You know, you have to think about who your leaders are first before you even think about going to military. But um, travel and enjoy life a little bit with, with little to no responsibilities. Um, and then come back around and say, okay, this is who I am in life. And this is what I want to do in life. And what are the steps I need to do to get to that? So um, you have to think outside the box to be an entrepreneur, I can tell you that. If you want to stay within the box, there's nothing wrong with that either. But that's just not who I am. And, and a lot of people in the world want to be their own boss, as they call it. But um, um, sometimes you have to do some things that are uncomfortable to find yourself before you can realize, you know, really what you want to do in life. I'm going to ask you one last question that spun out of what you just said about wanting to be your own boss. What have been the benefits to the quality of your life in choosing entrepreneurship? Well, there are pros and cons to it. I can tell you that, but I prefer, I prefer to say um, it hadn't always been uh, a good thing, but you get, you get to choose how successful you want to be. If you want a person that's um, think you can get up 12, one o'clock in the day and, and start your business, nine times out of 10, you're not going to be successful. Uh, you have to get up early in the morning. Um, I like being able to monitor my own schedule and not being told uh, what time to be in, what time to clock out, what time to take your lunch. Um, that's 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 one of the huge benefits i can tell you that okay so what about with family has it has it improved your presence as a father or um how has it added to the overall presence in your in your well it, it as far as um my time of quality at home has been um a huge impact uh, where I could um, make myself more available to my family. So that's, uh, that's priceless there to me, to be able to wake up and see them every morning. And if I am out of town, you know, we always call and we um, touch bases with each other. But just, um, just, just having your time, uh, you can't put a price tag on, I'll be honest with you. Mm -hmm. Sometimes you might not make as much as you want financially, but the time you have with your family, you can't put a dollar figure on it. Right. So uh, it, gave, it, gave, it gives me a lot of time to be around home. And uh, if I need to break away and, you know, from a business and go to a game or go to, um, like I'm running my son back and forth to <laughs> Elizabeth City uh, every week. I mean, it gives me time that I can do that. And then when I come back, I jump back into my business. So uh, just, just the quality of time is priceless to me. Thank you. And again, I just want to say thank you for making time for us. And um, you will always be 
a part of now the Allen University family, even though I know that that Bronco is sits deep in our hearts. Oh yeah, oh yeah, oh yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay. Think, you think you think Allen could give me an honorary doctorate degree? No, <laughs> <laughs> but. <laughs> <laughs> Look, well, we'll pray for you, okay? <laughs> Have a wonderful good. day. Thank All you. right, thank you. in our uh, community uh, writ large. And I think that COVID uh, really uh, brought this uh, to light in very stark ways. Um, so again, I hope that you uh, got a lot from this today, but more than that, I hope that some of the things that we learned about and talked about today, we can use the Curious Momentum Forward um, in helping to uh, you know, uh, enhance community building and that we can um, you know, pay it forward. Any information that we got here today, please share and disseminate this within a large community. Uh, again, I thank you for attending here today, the second annual entrepreneurship conference. I hope that you can join us again next year. And um, I thank you again for coming. My name is Dr. Kareem Muhammad. I'm the Dean of Business Education and Social Sciences. I thank you for your time here today. Greetings, everyone. I just want to take a moment to say thank you for everyone that made this virtual conference happen and made it so wonderful. Um, first, I want to say thank you to the faculty that supported and participated, uh, Ms. Haywood and Dr. Muhammad, who have been supported from the beginning to the end of the effort, Dr. Toddy, who's been my partner in making it happen and helping to bring such wonderful people to come and pour into the lives of our students. I just want to say thank you uh, to our student leaders from the entrepreneurship classes and from our business organizations. I want to say thank you for all that you do every day to represent the Allen University Business Department. I wanna do a special thanks to all of the students who lended their voices and their energy to make things happen. Ms. Brandy Williams and Jaquel Williams, Mr. Ishak Smith, Ms. Brenda McCoy, Mr. Charles Kinlaw and Robert Yates. We say thank you to each and every one of you. Mr. Jamal Johnson, um, our students have come, whether they were just entrepreneurship majors, whether they're in one of the entrepreneurship classes or the Finance 121 class, uh, they showed up and they did whatever they needed to do. Our um, organizations that were represented today, the Women in Business, Phi Beta Lambda, and the Entrepreneurship Club. And I just wanna end with a note to our students to say thank you for coming and being engaged and showing up to learn. And I want you to realize what was offered to you today and how people who did not know you decided to make room and space to share of their time and their resources just to help better your lives. We have panelists from, Dr. Carter was from Columbus, Ohio, Tania Payar from the Durham, North Carolina area, Mr. Clint Fleming was here local to Columbia, South Carolina, Mr. Glean graced us with his presence all the way from the Caribbeans, and Mr. Galloway was in the Suffolk, Virginia area. And so all of these people from diverse parts of the world wanted to be here just for you all today. So I hope that you take in, come back and listen to the parts that feed you the most, digest this information and use it to expand and grow yourselves as you pursue and stay focused on the greater things that life is calling you to. Be blessed. Again, this is Dr. Killens. I love you. Meet the Allen University Business Faculty. Dr. Kareem Muhammad, Dean, School of Business and Social Sciences. Ms. Malita Hayward, Department Chair, Business. Dr. Tati O. Tati, Sports Management. 
Dr. Kathy Quinn, Business. Dr. Tanetta Killens, Entrepreneurship. Dr. Melissa Houston, Human Resources. Mr. Evans Tundanso, Accounting. Mr. Jordan Jakubic, Statistics.